you so much. How does that sound? Can you hear me? Cheap seats in the back? Can you hear me? <laughs> yes? Good. Good evening. Allow me to begin on a personal note. This is a uh, picture of me taken around the time that my grandmother was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home to die. She already had so many bypass surgeries, she basically ran out of plumbing at some point. Confined in a wheelchair, crushing chest pain, her life was over at age 65. There was nothing more the doctors could do. Then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is detailed in Pritikin's biography. My grandma was one of the death's door people, like Francis Greger. My grandmother arrived in a wheelchair. Mrs. Greger had heart disease, angina claudication, her condition so bad. She could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks, though, she was not only out of her wheelchair, she was walking 10 miles a day. This is a picture of my grandma taken 15 years uh, after the doctors had abandoned her to die at her grandson's wedding. She was given her medical death sentence at age 65. Thanks to a healthy diet, she was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet till age 96 to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That is why I went into medicine. You know, when Dr. Dean Ornish, years later, published his lifestyle heart trial, proving with something called quantitative angiography, that indeed heart disease could be reversed. Arteries opened up without drugs, without surgery, and the majority of people with just a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. I assumed this was going to be the game changer. I mean, my family had seen it with their own eyes. But here it was, in black and white, published in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world. In fact, his first publication, of the Lifestyle Heart Trial was in The Lancet, um, which is a UK medical journal, perhaps the most prestigious medical journal in the world. But nothing happened. So wait a second. If effectively the cure to a leading killer heart disease could get you know, lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be out there in the medical literature that you know, just didn't have a corporate budget driving its promotion, but could help my patients. Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. For those of you who are unfamiliar with my work, every year I read through every English language nutrition journal in the world, so busy folks like you don't have to. Right? Um, uh, I then try to compile all the most uh, interesting, most groundbreaking, most practical findings and new videos and articles I upload every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no corporate sponsorships, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything, just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love. New videos and articles every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. OK, so where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, a network of missionary hospitals set up by largely British physicians um, throughout sub-Saharan Africa uncovered what may be one of the most important uh, medical advances, the fact that many of the major and commonest diseases in the modern world were universally rare, uh, according to one of our uh, great uh, prominent medical leaders, Irish surgeon Dennis Burkett. Universally rare like heart disease. For example, in the African population of Uganda, they uh, found that coronary heart disease was almost non-existent. Wait a second, a leading killer? Almost non-existent? What were they eating? Well, they're eating lots of vegetables and grains and greens, and their protein 
almost exclusively from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one sees in modern day plant eaters. In UK units, this is down around 3.8 or so. Say, so wait a second. Maybe the uh, Africans were just dying early of something else, never lived long enough to get heart disease. No. Here's age-matched heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis, Missouri in the States. Out of 632 autopsies in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction. Out of 632 age and gender matched um, autopsies in Uganda, 136 myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our leading killer in the States. They were so blown away, they went back, did another 800 autopsies in Uganda, still just that one small healed inf infarct out of, uh, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death, out of 1,427 patients, less than one in a thousand. Whereas here in the UK, heart disease is an epidemic. Here's a list of diseases commonly found here and in places that eat and live like the UK, but were rare or even non-existent among populations centering their diets around whole plant foods. These are among our most common conditions. For example, obesity, hiatal hernia, one of the most common stomach problems, varicose veins and hemorrhoids, two most common venous problems, colorectal cancer, leading cancer killer, uh, diverticulosis, probably the most common disease of the intestines, Appendicitis, number one cause of emergency abdominal surgery, gallbladder disease, number one cause of non-emergency abdominal surgery, as well as ischemic heart disease, one of the commonest cause of deaths here, but a rarity among these plant-based populations, which suggests that heart disease may be a choice, like cavities. If you look at the teeth of people who lived 10,000 years before the invention of the toothbrush, pretty much no cavities. Didn't brush a day in their lives, no flossing, yet no cavities. Why? Because candy bars hadn't been invented yet. So why do people continue to get cavities when we know they're preventable through dietary change? Well, easy, because the pleasure we derive from dessert may outweigh the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. And look, that's fine. I mean, you know, as long as people understand the consequences of their actions, as a physician, what more can I do? If you think the benefits outweigh the risks for you and your family, then go for it. I mean, I certainly enjoy the occasional indulgence. I've got a good, you know, dental insurance plan. But what if instead of the plaque on our teeth, we're talking about the plaque building up inside of our arteries, another disease that can be prevented with a plant-based, with dietary changes. Okay, so now, what are the consequences for you and your family? Right now, we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Now we're talking life and death. It's still up to each of us to make our own decisions as to what to eat and how to live, but we should make these choices consciously, educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, is a disease that begins in childhood. By age 10, most children raised on the standard Western diet already have what are called fatty streaks, the first stage of the disease within their arteries, which can then these, um, turn into plaques in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then start killing us off. In our heart, it's called a heart attack. In our brain, the same disease can be called a stroke. So, I mean, if there's anyone here today older than age 10, then the question is not whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease. It's whether you want to reverse the heart disease that you likely already have. Is that even possible? 
You know, when researchers took people with heart disease, put them on the kind of diet followed by populations that did not get heart disease, their hope was that maybe we can slow the disease down, maybe even stop it. But instead, something miraculous happened. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their body was able to start to dissolve some of that plaque away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies wanted to be healthy all along, but were just never given the chance. See this dramatic improvement in blood flow to the heart muscle? This was after just three weeks eating healthy. Let me share with you what's been called the best kept secret in all of medicine. The best kept secret in medicine is that sometimes, given the right conditions, the body can heal itself. You know, if you, uh, you, know, you whack your shin really hard on a, a coffee table, you can get a red hot, painful, swollen, inflamed butt will heal naturally if you just stand back and let your body work its magic. OK, but what if you start whacking your shin every day in the same place? In fact, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> it never heals. You go to your doctor and be like, oh, my shin hurts. They'd be like, no problem. I train for this. They whip out their pad, write you a prescription for it, painkiller. So you're still whacking your shin three times a day. Oh, it still really hurts, but oh, it feels so much better with those pain pills on board. Thank heavens for modern medicine. You know, it's like taking nitroglycerin pills for angina, crushing chest pain. Tremendous relief, but you're not doing anything to treat the cause of the disease. Our body wants to come back to health if we let it. But if we keep re-damaging ourselves every day, we may never heal. It was like smoking. One of the most amazing things I learned in all my medical training was that within 15 years of stopping smoking, your lung, your lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Isn't that amazing? Your lungs can like clear out all that tar, and eventually it's almost as if you never started smoking at all. And every morning of our smoking life, that healing process started until wham, our first cigarette of the day. Re-injuring our lungs with every puff, just like we can re-injure our arteries with every bite, when all we had to do all along, the miracle cure is to just stand back, get out of the way, and let our body stop re-injuring ourselves, let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health. This is nothing new. We've known about this for decades, right? That the body is a healing machine. Now, sure, you could choose moderation and hit yourself with a smaller hammer. <laughs> but why beat yourself up at all? We've known this for a while. 1977, American Heart Journal. Um, like cases like Mr. FW here, this, these are actually cases, um, these are actually UK cases. These are, um, this is a, a British man um, uh, whose heart disease so bad, couldn't even make it to the mailbox, started eating healthier, and a few months later, climbing mountains, no pain. <laughs> Now, there are new fancy classes of anti-angina drugs on the market now. Um, cost thousands of dollars a year. But at the highest dose, may extend exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. It does not look like those choosing the drug route are going to be climbing mountains anytime soon. See, plant-based diets aren't just safer and cheaper. They can work better because you're treating the actual cause of the disease. But you know, according to the World Health Organization, heart disease is not the UK's number one killer. 
Heart disease is killer number two. Killer number one in the UK is cancer. What happens if you put cancer on a vegan diet? Well, Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues took men with early prostate cancer, put them on a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors, was able to reverse the progression of disease, and no wonder. If you take people eating the standard Western diet, in this case the standard American diet, and you drip their blood on cancer cells growing in a petri dish, you can suppress cancer cell growth by 9%. Put people on a plant-based diet for a year, though, and their blood can do this. The blood circulating throughout the bodies of people eating plant-based diets has nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to suppressing cancer cell growth. Now, this was for men in prostate cancer. Uh, they wanted to repeat the study using women in breast cancer, the number one cancer killer specific to women here in the UK. But look, they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Women are dying now. So let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks against three different lines of human breast cancer. This is the before cancer cell growth powering away at 100%. This is after eating healthy just two weeks. This is what's called a photomicrograph. A photograph taken under a microscope, what they did is they laid down a confluent layer of breast cancer, so like a carpet of breast cancer, dripped the blood of women in a standard American diet onto that cancer, and you can see um, it kind of breaks that cancer up into these kind of cancer continents here. But then you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet, and retest two weeks later, right? So they act as their own controls. Same women, two weeks later on a plant-based diet, they, they put another, they lay down another carpet of breast cancer, then drip their blood two weeks later on it, and all you're left with is this. Their bodies cleaned up, right? before and after, just two weeks eating healthy. Right? Uh, they're like an entirely different person inside. Right? Their blood became that much more hostile to cancer. Now, suppressing cancer cell growth is nice. Getting rid of it is even better. This is what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. Their bodies were able to reprogram cancer cells, forcing them into early retirement. Um, you can see my screen is starting to yellow. Let me stop that. Um, uh, sorry about that. We are no longer yellow. Um, uh, you say, why would this screen be going yellow? It's actually the blue rays. We shouldn't, uh, it messes up our circadian rhythms, the blue um, wavelength. So as the sun sets, we shouldn't have lots of bright light in our face. Um, and so there's a neat free program called Flux, which you can turn your screens yellow and, and cut down the Blu-rays, and anyway. Anyway, OK, here we go. But the caveat is you have to turn it off before you give lectures in the evening. I, it's just, <clears throat> anyway. Um, all right, so apoptosis programs cell death. The body's able to reprogram cancer cells, forcing them into early retirement. This is what's called tunnel imaging, measuring DNA fragmentation or cell death, where dying cancer cells show up as little white spots. So as you can see, even women with pretty poor diets are not totally defenseless. They can kill off a few cancer cells. You take these same women two weeks later, and their blood can do that. The blood circulating throughout the women eating plant-based diets significantly gained the power to, to slow down and stop breast cancer cell growth within just two weeks. What kind of blood do we want in our body? What kind of immune system? Or do we want blood to circulate, you know, that just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop it? Now, this dramatic strengthening in cancer defenses was after two weeks of a diet and exercise. They had these women walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. You say, well, wait a second. If you do two things, how do you know what role the diet played? So researchers decided to put it to the test. This is what we saw before, the cancer-stopping power of diet and exercise. Again, this is measuring cancer cell clearance. In this case, 
a plant-based diet on average for 14 years, along with mild daily exercise like walking every day. That's the kind of cancer cell clearance you can get. Compare that to the cancer-stopping power of your average um, sedentary uh, um, omnivore. You see a little burger there. Um, <laughs> which uh, essentially is non-existent. All right, but this is the interesting group in the middle. What about 14 years standard American diet, but 14 years daily, strenuous, hour-long exercise like calisthenics? <laughs> they wanted to know if you exercise long enough, if you exercise hard enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters over here? And the answer is exercise helped, no question. But literally 5,000 hours in the gym appeared no match for a plant-based diet. Here's the, uh, that same tunnel imaging we saw before. Even if you're a couch potato, living off of fried potatoes, you are not totally defenseless. You can uh, kill a few cancer cells off. If you exercise for five, thousand hours you can kill cancer cells left and right but nothing appears to kick more cancer tush than a plant-based diet. What we think is going on is that the consumption of animal protein, meat, egg white and dairy protein increases the levels of something called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, a cancer-promoting growth hormone involved in the acquisition and progression of malignant tumors. But if you start eating plant-based, within weeks your levels of IGF-1 um, go down, and within years, if you continue to eat healthy, they go down even further. And your levels of, levels of IGF-1 binding protein go up. IGF-1 binding proteins like our body's emergency break. One of our ways our body protects itself from cancer, protects itself from excessive growth. Sure, in as few as two weeks, you can drop your liver's production of uh, IGF-1, but what about all the IGF-1 you have circulating in the system from the bacon and eggs you had three weeks ago? All right, well, your liver releases this snatch squad of binding proteins into the circulation to tie up any excess IGF-1, pull it out of the body, and your protective levels go up within weeks, and benefits continue to accrue the longer you eat healthy. Here's the experiment that really nailed IGF-1 as the villain. Uh, same as before, um, plant-based diet and exercise, cancer cell growth plummets, cancer cell death shoots up. But here's the interesting column. What if you add back to the cancer just the amount of IGF-1 you banish from your system because you started eating healthy, what happens? You effectively erase the diet and exercise effect. It's almost as if you never started eating healthy at all. So the reason, one of the largest studies on diet and cancer found that the incidence of all cancers combined, um, and this is actually from Epic Oxford, um, here in the neighborhood, um, the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among those eating more plant-based, maybe because they're eating less animal protein, less meat, egg white, and dairy protein, which means less um, uh, IGF-1, which means less cancer growth. How much less cancer growth? Um, uh, well, I'm eating a lot of uh, protein during middle age associated with a 75% increase um, in uh, overall mortality, a fourfold increase in risk of dying from cancer, but not all proteins, specifically animal protein, which makes sense given the relationship between animal protein and IGF-1. The academic institution at which this study was done sent out a press release with a memorable opening line, that chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette. Noting that eating lots of animal protein in middle age um, may quadruple one's risk of dying from cancer, which is com comparable to what one might get smoking cigarettes. So what was the response in the nutrition community to this revelation that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy could be the harmful to health of smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist said it was potentially dangerous to tell people about this study. Why? Because someone might think, hey, a smoker might think, why bother quitting smoking? My ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me. <laughs> so let's not tell anyone about this meat and dairy thing. 
And it reminds me of this famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing the risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day, maybe three times as bad, 62% increased risk of lung cancer or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, or tripling your risk of heart disease eating non-vegetarian, or multiplying your risk sixfold if you eat lots of meat and dairy. So, they conclude, let's keep some perspective here. <laughs> the risks of secondhand smoke may be well below that of other everyday activities, so breathe deep. It's like saying, yeah, don't worry about getting stabbed, because getting shot so much worse. <laughs> uh, how about neither? Two risks don't make a right. Of course, you'll note that Philip Morris stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Killer number three in Great Britain is stroke. Preventing strokes? Uh, maybe all about eating potassium-rich foods, yet most uh, people eat potassium-deficient diets. Um, in the States, that means um, we're talking 98%, more than 98% of Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum daily intake of potassium because 98% of Americans don't eat enough plants. Potassium comes from the words pot, ash, take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce to ash, left with pot, ash, yum, potassium, vegetable, alkali. But who can name me one plant particularly high in potassium? <laughs> Bananas, of course. Wherever I go, I was in Tel Aviv yesterday, then Berlin before, wherever I go, that's one thing everybody knows about nutrition. Bananas have, I don't know, like Chiquita must have had a great PR firm or something. Like, turns out, bananas, don't even make the top 50 sources. <laughs> Coming in at number 86, right behind fast food vanilla milkshakes. It goes, and then bananas. <laughs> it's funny, when I was uh, writing the new book, I went back to make sure it still had the same place. But no, the USDA nutrient database had expanded. Now, currently, bananas don't even make the top 1,000. Coming in at number 1,611, right after Reese's Pieces. <laughs> I kid you not. The most concentrated sources of potassium in the diet, number one, greens. Number two, beans. And number three, dates. So bananas don't even make the top thousand. In fact, if you look at the eighth leading cause of death in Great Britain, bananas could be downright dangerous. <laughs> Fourth leading killer in the UK is Alzheimer's and dementia. You know, 20 years ago, it wasn't even in the top 10. According to the latest dietary guidelines for the prevention of Alzheimer's, the two most important things we can do, number one, cut down our intake of meat, dairy, and junk, and replace that with, oh, sorry, where, oh, all right. Um, that was a weird transition. Um, and replace it with um, vegetables, legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, fruits, and whole grains. Um, uh, and this is based in part on data going back decades now that show that those who eat meat, red meat, white meat, doesn't appear to matter between two to three times um, increased risk of becoming demented later in life, and the longer one eats meat-free, the lower one's risk appears to fall. Killer number five, respiratory infection. You say, okay, what, what possible role could diet play in respiratory infections? Obviously, you haven't seen my video, Kale and the Immune System talking about the immunostimulatory effects of kale. Is there anything kale cannot do? <laughs> Boosting antibody production sevenfold, but this was in a petri dish. What about in people? 
If you take older men and women in their 60s and 70s, right before getting their Pneumovax vaccination, their pneumonia vaccination, split them up into two groups, half eat their regular diet, the other half you just add a few servings of fruits and vegetables. What happens? You get a significant boosted protective antibody response in those that added a few servings of produce to their diet. This was not cutting out meat, just adding some extra fruit and veg um, can increase your immune function. Killer number six, lung disease, like chronic COPD, like emphysema, thankfully. Um, uh, COB, we can help prevent um, COPD with a plant-based diet, even be used to treat COPD with plants, um, significantly improving lung function over time. But uh, you know, the tobacco industry had a very different spin on this. If, if adding plants to our diet can improve lung function, I mean, wouldn't it be easier if we can add plants to cigarettes? And indeed, the addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Next, they're going to start adding berries to meat. And indeed, I couldn't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. The addition, of, the addition of fruit extracts to burger patties was not without its glitches. For example, the blackberries dyed the burger patties a distinct purplish color, which kind of turned people off. Though evidently, you can improve the tenderness of lamb carcasses if you infuse them before rigor mortis sets in with kiwi fruit juice. You can even improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding powdered grape seeds, uh, though there were complaints that the grape seed particles became visible in the final product. And you know, look, if there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters, it's that they're picky about what goes in their food. <laughs> oh, oh, a pig anus? Okay, but grape seeds, oh! <laughs> Um, so killer number seven, sepsis. This is uh, systemic blood-borne infections. Now sure, uh, foodborne bacteria can burrow through the intestinal wall, sometimes get into the bloodstream, but in women can creep up into their bladder. We've known for decades now that it's actually bacteria crawling up from the rectum that cause um, bladder infections in women, but only recently did we discover where this reservoir of bladder-infecting E. coli was coming from. And now we know it's coming from chicken. We now have DNA fingerprinting proof of a direct link um, between um, meat, um, uh, between farm animals' meat and bladder infections in women. Solid evidence um, that uh, urinary tract infections can be what's called a zoonosis, an animal to human disease. So well, wait a second, who undercooks chicken? Can't you just use a meat thermometer, cook the meat through? What's the big deal? The big deal is what's called cross-contamination. If you take 40 families, give them a frozen chicken to prepare and cook in their home as they normally would, and multitudes of antibiotic-resistant E. coli jump from the chicken into the guts of the volunteers even before they eat it. So you could incinerate that chicken to ash. You don't even have to eat any of it. You're infected before it even makes it into the oven. Within days, the um, chicken bacteria had multiplied to the point of becoming a major part of the person's gut floor. Chicken bacteria was like taking over. So, okay, well, wait a second. What if you do safe handling guidelines in addition to safe cooking guidelines? So, for example, um, the USDA, not that anyone actually does this, recommends everyone should spray all the kitchen surfaces with a dilute bleach solution, then you, then you wipe it all down. And even if you instruct people how to do this, and then come in later and swab around kitchen surfaces, you can find significant numbers of uh, serious fecal pathogens like salmonella and campylobacter, like on the utensils and dishcloth, counter, sink rim, et cetera. In fact, the reason that you can find more bacteria from feces in people's sink, kitchen sink, than on their toilet seat is because people tend to rinse chickens in the sink, not the toilet. <laughs> now, the good news is, it's not like you eat chicken once and you're colonized for life. The, in this experiment, the chicken bacteria only seemed to last about 10 days before your good bacteria could muscle it out of the way. 
Okay, but the problem is many families eat chicken more than once every 10 days, so maybe constantly reintroducing these chicken bugs into their system. Wait a second. You can't sell unsafe cars. You can't sell unsafe toys. How is it even legal to sell unsafe meat? Well, they do it by blaming the consumers. One USDA poultry microbiologist said, look, raw meats are not idiot proof. They can be mishandled when they are. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, someone's going to get hurt. Now, while some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, our poultry microbiologists disagree, saying, no, it's the consumer that has the most responsibility. It's like uh, you know, some car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not putting your kid in a seatbelt. You know, the head of the CDC's food poisoning division famously responded to this blame the victim attitude coming from the meat industry. Is it reasonable, she asked. Is it reasonable that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? Not to worry, the meat industry's on it. They just got FDA approval in the States to spray a bacteria-eating virus on, uh, on the meat. So if you're, uh, um, uh, if you're uh, traveling to the States, you can enjoy our bacteriophages. Um, this is, uh, now the, there's a consumer, uh, there's concern among industry about uh, the acceptance of these so-called uh, bacteriophages. It may present some of a challenge to the food industry, so they're not gonna label it or anything. But if they think that's going to be a challenge, check out their other bright idea. The effect of extracted house life, this is a sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meat. Now, wait, it's a low cost and simple. Think about it. <laughs> Look, maggots thrive off of rotting flesh. However, there have been no reports of maggots having any serious diseases. So hey, they must be filled with some kind of antibacterial something, right? Have you ever seen a maggot sneeze? I didn't think so. <laughs> so let's take some maggots, grow them three days old, wash them off, towel them off, a little Vitamix action there. Voila! Safer meat. Killer number nine is liver disease. We've known for decades now that you can treat liver disease with a plant-based diet, significantly reducing the levels of toxins that would otherwise build up eating meat without a fully functional liver to detoxify your blood. One does have to admit, though, there are some people on plant-based diets with worsening liver failure. They're called Alcoholics living off of potatoes and grapes and barley and it's strictly plant-based, but not doing so well. We're not sure exactly what. <clears throat> Next on the list is Parkinson's disease. Does a plant-based diet reduce one's risk of Parkinson's disease? Well, we know that most studies done to date have found this link, this apparent link between dairy consumption and Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's, why might that be? Well, there's evidence that the global milk supply is contaminated with neurotoxins. So we find high levels of certain pesticides, um, um, not only in the milk supply, but in uh, specific regions of the brain um, in, uh, in Parkinson's patients on autopsy. So they're talking about pollutants like tetrahydroisoquinoline, which is actually what the scientists used to try to recreate the disease in primates in a laboratory, found particularly in cheese, actually. But so there's been uh, you know, calls on the dairy industry to, to screen their milk for toxins. Good luck with that. Of course, you could just not drink it, but then what would happen to your bones? That's a marketing ploy. If you look at the actual science, milk does not appear to protect against hip fracture risk. Whether you're drinking it as an adult, whether you're drinking it as a teen, doesn't matter, doesn't work, may actually even increase the risk of fractures, which may explain why the countries with the highest milk consumption um, have among the highest hip fracture rates. So Swedish researchers decided to put it to the test. 100,000 men and women fall for nearly 20 years. What did they find? Milk drinking women at higher rates of what? Higher rates of death. 
Um, significantly more heart disease and cancer for each daily glass of milk. Um, women that drank three glasses a day um, nearly doubled their risk of premature death. And they had more bone and hip fractures too, more milk, more fractures. And milk drinking men also had higher rates of death. Um, yet for some reason you don't see milk ads like this. I don't know exactly what. Uh, <clears throat> Killer number 11 in the UK is diabetes. A disease that we can prevent, arrest, and even reverse type 2 diabetes. Um, something that we've known since the 1930s. Poor people on plant-based diet, um, uh, and a quarter of the diabetics were off insulin altogether after a period of five years. But look, plant-based diets are comparatively low-calorie diets. So wait a second, maybe their diabetes got better just because they lost so much weight. So to tease that out, I mean, what you'd have to do is design a study where you put people on a healthy diet, but force them to eat so much food that they don't lose weight. Um, then you could see if, if plant-based diets had unique benefits beyond just all the weight loss. Well, we'd have to wait uh, 45 years, but here it is. They weighed subjects every day, and if they started to lose weight, they were made to eat more food. In fact, so much more food, many had problems eating it all. They're like, oh, not another salad. <laughs> but they adapted so. Zero weight loss despite restricting meat, eggs, dairy, and junk. Okay, so with zero weight loss, was a plant-based diet still helpful? Well, insulin needs were cut 60%, and half the diabetics ended up off all insulin altogether. How many years did that take? No, 16 days. 16 days days later. So we're talking diabetics with diabetes for as long as 20 years, injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then 13 days later on none. Diabetes for 20 years off all insulin less than two weeks. Diabetes for 20 years because no one had told her about a plant-based diet. Here's subject number 15. 32 units of insulin on the control diet, then 18 days later on none. Lower blood sugars on 32 units less insulin. That's the power of plants. Remember, even without any weight loss. And as a side effect, their cholesterol dropped like a rock to under 150, so this is about 3.8, exactly where we wanted to see our cholesterol. Um, again, within about two weeks. So just like moderate changes in diet will only be benefit you moderately when it comes to cholesterol, how moderate do you want your diabetes? Right? Asking diabetics to make modest changes in diet can leave them with modest vision loss, uh, modest kidney failure, right? modest amputation, maybe just a few toes or something. <laughs> Moderation in all things is not necessarily a good thing. Okay, remember this study purported to show that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful health of smoking? Supposedly suggested that those who eat lots of meat, eggs, and dairy are four times as likely to die from cancer or diabetes. But if you look at the actual study, you'll see that's simply not true. Those eating more animal protein in middle age didn't have four times the risk of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the risk of dying from diabetes, though that's quite a confidence interval. Now, those that chose moderation, just eating a moderate amount of animal protein, see, they just had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. Killer number 12 in the UK is high blood pressure. So in the States, 78 million Americans affected. Um, and there and here, most, affects most of us um, by the time we hit about age 60. You say, well, wait a second. 
it affects most of us when we get older. Maybe it's less a disease and more just an inevitable consequence of aging. No, we've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. A thousand people, a thousand people in rural Kenya, um, uh, their blood pressures were measured. Um, they were eating a diet um, uh, centered around grains, beans, vegetables, fruit, and greens. Our pressures go up as we age. Their pressures go down. And the lower, the better. You know, this whole 140 over 90 cutoff is arbitrary. We now have data that even people with blood pressures under 20 over 80, 120 over 80 would benefit from blood pressure reduction. I mean, if you had 120 over 80, your doctor would give you a gold star. But now we have evidence that even people under 120 over 80 appear to benefit from blood pressure reduction. So the ideal blood pressure the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure, 110 over 70. 110, I mean, is it even possible to get blood pressures down to 110 over 70? It's not just possible, it's normal for those eating healthy enough diets. So, Two years of this rural Kenyan hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. How many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Zero. Wow. They must have had a low uh, heart disease rates, right? No, they had no heart disease rates. Not a single case of atherosclerosis, number two killer here in the UK found. Rural China, same thing. About 110 over 70 their entire lives. 70 year olds, same average blood pressure, 16 year olds. Right? Okay, now wait a second. Asia, Africa, vastly different diets, but what they shared in common was that they were plant based day to day with meat only eaten on special occasions. Now I said, wait a second, why do we think it's the plant based nature of the diets that was so uh, protected? Because in the Western world, the only folks getting it down that low, according to the American Heart Association, were the strict vegetarians, coming in at about 110 over 65. This is the largest study of plant-based eaters to date, based on about 89,000 Californians, comparing non-vegetarians the so-called semi-vegetarians, people who eat meat more like on a weekly basis than a daily basis, compared to people that eat no meat except fish, compared to people who eat no meat, period, compared to people who eat no meat, eggs, and dairy on a regular basis. And as you can see, um, there's a stepwise drop in hypertension rates as one gets more and more plant-based. We see that same apparent trend with type 2 diabetes and with obesity. So sure, we may be able to throw the majority of our risk out the window eating strictly plant-based, but the important thing about this slide is look, you can get significant benefit any step along the way. So it's not black or white, it's not all or nothing. Any movement we can make towards along the spectrum towards eating healthy can accrue significant health benefits. Experimentally, you can show this with high blood pressure. You take vegetarians, you give them meat, pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you take people who eat meat, remove meat from their diet, and blood pressures go down within seven days. And this is after most people had to reduce or stop their blood pressure medications. They had to. Why? Their blood pressures are getting too low. If you treat the cause of the disease, Right? You can't be on blood pressure medications with normal blood pressure, you'll drop too low. So people on blood sugar medications, blood pressure medications need to do this with their doctor because we underestimate the power of diet to rapidly resolve their disease. Um, and um, um, and so, uh, so the kind of the side effect, plant-based diet, may not have to take medications, ironically. So. Does the American Heart Association promote a no-meat diet? No, they promote a low-meat diet, so-called DASH diet, which is kind of the, the only diet really officially promoted by the US government. Why not plant-based? I mean, when the DASH diet was being created, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? 
uh, uh, no, they were where the chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. See, the DASH diet was created with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of a vegetarian diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general public. They didn't think the public could handle the truth. <laughs> now you can see what they were thinking. Look, just like drugs never work unless you actually take them, diets never work at all unless you actually eat them. So they're like, look, no one's going to eat strictly plant-based. So, I mean, so we have to come up with some kind of compromise diet. Um, and then on a population scale, we may be able to actually do more good. All right. Okay, but tell that to the 1,000 American families a day that lose a family member to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the public the truth. Killer number 13 in the UK is kidney. We talked about liver failure. What about kidney failure? We can both prevent and treat um, kidney disease with a plant-based diet. And no wonder kidneys are highly vascular organs. Harvard researchers found three dietary risk factors for declining kidney function. Number one, animal protein. Number two, animal fat. And number three, cholesterol. Animal fat can alter the actual structure of the kidney based on uh, autopsy studies, for example, showing plugs of fat clogging up the works in autopsied human kidneys. And animal protein can have a profound effect on normal kidney function, inducing what's called hyperfiltration, increasing the workload on the kidney, but not plant protein. You have people eat tuna fish, a meal of tuna fish, and you can see increased pressure in the kidneys one, two, three hours after the meal in both non-diabetics and diabetics. Right? We're talking adverse effects not decades down the road, but within hours of it going into our mouth. OK, but what if you ate the exact same amount of protein, but instead of having a tuna fish salad sandwich, you had a tofu salad sandwich? What would happen? Absolutely nothing. Your kidneys can handle plant protein without even batting an eyelash. Wait a second, so why does animal protein cause that overload reaction, but not plant protein? We think it's the inflammation triggered by animal protein. How do we know that? Because if you give a powerful anti-inflammatory drug along with that tuna fish, you can abolish that protein leakage hyperfiltration response to meat ingestion. <coughs> and then there's the acid load. The consumption of foods like meat, eggs, and cheese induces the formation of acid within the kidneys, uh, which can cause something called tubular toxicity damage to the delicate urine-making tubes within um, the kidneys. Animal foods tend to be acid-forming, particularly fish, which is the worst, um, whereas plant foods tend to either be neutral or actually base-forming, alkaline, um, counteracting some of the acid formation in our kidneys, particularly dark green leafy vegetables. So the progression of chronic kidney disease. So the key to halting the progression may lie in the produce aisle rather than the pharmacy. No surprise, then, that plant-based diets have been used to treat kidney disease for decades. Here's protein leakage on a standard low-sodium diet. This is typically what, uh, GP, what doctors would put people with uh, declining kidney function on. All right, but then they switch them to, to a supplemented vegan diet. So s conventional, plant-based. Conventional, plant-based. Switching on and off kidney dysfunction like a light switch based on what was going into their mouth. And finally, killer 14 is suicide. Now, we've known for decades that people who eat healthier tend to feel healthier. Um, in fact, only about half 
um, the, uh, the um, depression, anxiety, and stress scores compared to people that eat meat, um, the thought, um, if this was causal, um, was that it's uh, this arachidonic acid in animal products. This is a long chain inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid found predominantly in chicken and eggs. That's, that's uh, by far uh, chicken and eggs, um, but also found in beef and other uh, animal products. Um, but you don't know until you put it to the test. So they took people eating the standard American diet, removed meat, removed fish, removed poultry, removed eggs as well from the diet, saw a significant improvement within just two weeks in mood scores. Okay. And it can take drugs like Prozac months to take an effect, significant improvement within two weeks. And so the thought is um, that this arachidonic acid in animal products was adversely impacting mental health via a cascade of neuroinflammation, brain inflammation, but we may be able to clear up this inflammation within our brains within two weeks by cutting down our consumption of eggs, chicken, and other meat. So, wait a second, am I just cherry picking here? What about all the other diets that have been shown to significantly improve mood? There aren't. Any. This is the latest large review. Found that only the plant-based dietary intervention significantly improved mood using this rigorous, you know, randomized controlled design. It's uh, hard to cherry pick when there's only one cherry. <laughs> um, works in a workplace setting too. Um, this was done at Geico Insurance. Um, uh, they increased, they added uh, vegan options to the menu like lentil soup and bean burritos and gave them some education compared to a control site. Um, and so, of course, not only did we get improvement in physical function, general health, but also vitality and mental health. And so uh, this led to improved worker productivity, which, of course, is what the company really cares about. Um, so they expanded this across 10 corporate sites across the country compared to control sites where they didn't add the... Um, uh, um, vegan options and education, and in the places that they did, found significant improvements, depression, anxiety, fatigue, emotional well-being, daily functional, functioning, emotional health. So lifestyle approaches like exercise can significantly improve not just physical health but mental health, and these plant-based diets may be particularly effective. So there we go, the 14 leading causes of death in the UK and a plant-based diet may help prevent nearly all of them, be used to treat more than half of them, and even reverse the course of disease in some of them, including, in some cases, the top two killers of British individuals. Now look, there are drugs that can help too. There's cholesterol-lowering statin drugs for heart disease. There's all sorts of um, uh, you know, insulin injections and sugar pills or diabetes. Usually it takes a couple different classes of blood pressure medications to force a woman's blood pressure down. But the same diet does it all. It's not like there's a heart-healthy diet that's somehow different from a, from a brain-healthy diet. No, a kidney-healthy diet is a liver-healthy diet, is a whole body-healthy diet, one diet to rule them all. And what about drug side effects? I'm not talking about a little rash here or something. Prescription drugs kill. More than 100,000 Americans uh, every year. Um, in fact, if you do the math, um, that means that the sixth leading killer in the United States is doctors. <laughs> the sixth leading killer is me. Thankfully, I can be prevented with a plant-based diet. <laughs> um, now, we don't actually, I look, there are not similar um, stats on so-called iatrogenic or, um, uh, or doctor-induced deaths here in the UK. But if a similar proportion of deaths, as in the state, if US doctors kill as many people as British doctors and vice versa, then we would expect that the seventh leading cause of death in the UK would be due to health care. Um, and indeed, compared to 15,000 vegetarians, those that eat meat, about twice the odds of being on aspirin, sleeping pills, tranquilizers, and acids, painkillers, blood pressure medications, laxatives, of course, as well as insulin. And so plant-based diets are great for people that don't like taking pills, for people that don't like paying for pills, for people that don't like risking drug side effects. 
want to uh, want to help the healthcare crisis, the NHS crisis in the UK, I have a suggestion. You know, there's only one diet that's ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, a plant-based diet. So, I mean, anytime anyone tries to sell you on some new diet they hear it about, do me a favor. Ask them a simple question. Say, well, wait a second. Has this diet been proven to reverse heart disease? You know, number two reason me and all my loved ones will die? If the answer is no, why would you even consider it, right? If that's all a plant-based diet can do, reverse the number two killer in this country, uh, shouldn't that kind of be the default diet until proven otherwise? And the fact that it can also be effective in helping to prevent, treat, and reverse other leading killers like high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Most deaths are preventable and related to nutrition. In the US, the number one cause of death and the number one cause of disability is our diet bumping tobacco smoking to number two. Cigarettes now only kill half a million Americans every year, whereas our diet kills hundreds of thousands more. So surely the British diet isn't the number one killer in this country, but it is. Um, so this is the Global Burden of Z study, the largest study of risk factors in human history, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The number one cause of death and disability, the number one cause of healthy life lost in this country, is it cigarettes? No. It's the British diet, number one. Then it's cigarettes. So let me close with a thought experiment. Imagine yourself a smoker in the, let's say, 1950s, for example, where in the US, for example, the per capita cigarette consumption was 4,000 cigarettes a day, meaning the average American walking around smoking half pack a day. The media was telling people to smoke. Famous athletes agreed. Even Santa Claus wanted you to smoke. I mean, look, you want to keep fit and uh, stay slender, so you make sure to smoke and uh, you know, eat lots of hot dogs to stay trim and eat lots of sugar to stay slim and trim. You know, a lot better than that apple there. I mean, sheesh, right? <laughs> Though apples do connote goodness and freshness, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, raising the possibilities for making a youth-oriented cigarette. They wanted to make apple-flavored cigarettes for kids. Shameless. For digestion's sake, you smoke. I mean, no curative power is claimed by Philip Morris, but hey, better safe than sorry, and smoke. Blow in her face, and she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> No woman ever says no, they're so round, so firm, so fully packed. <laughs> After all, John Wayne smoked them until he got lung cancer and died. You know, back then, even the paleo folks were smoking. <laughs> and so were the doctors. Now, this is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical profession. Yes, you know, some doctors smoke camels, but you know, others preferred Lucky, so it was a little, uh, little disagreement there. The leader of the US Senate agreed. I mean, how could, uh, who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Not a single case of throat irritation. How could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink? in Flint, Michigan, maybe. <clears throat> but don't worry, if you do get irritated, your doctor can always write you a prescription for more cigarettes. This is in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So when the AMA, the American Medical Association, is suggesting that, that cigarettes on balance may be beneficial, 
when the medical establishment is saying that where could you turn if you just wanted the science? What's the new data advanced by science? Well, she was too tired for fun, and then she smoked a camel. <laughs> Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science, that is, when he still could speak before he died of throat cancer. So you know, if by some miracle, there was some smokingfacts.org website back then that could deliver the signs directly, bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filters, you would have become aware of studies like this. This is an Adventist study out of California in 1958 found that non-smokers at least 90% less lung cancer than smokers. Right? This wasn't the first. Um, when uh, famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why his studies back in the 30s linking smoking and lung cancer were simply ignored, he had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was everywhere. It was in the movies. Um, uh, the medical meetings were one heavy haze of smoke. Smoking was, in a word, normal. So, back to our thought experiment. If you're a smoker in the 50s in the know, what do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize, you know, the best available balance of evidence suggests your smoking habit not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? If you wait until your doctor tells you between puffs to quit, you could have cancer by then. If you wait until the powers that be officially recognize it, like the Surgeon General did in the subsequent decade, um, uh, you could be dead by then. It took 25 years and more than 7,000 studies and the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General's report against smoking came out. Uh, you'd think maybe after the first 6,000, they could have given people a little heads up or something? <laughs> no, powerful industry. Right? On one hand, you had all of society, as a smoker in the 50s, all of society, the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, all you had was the science. If you were even aware of studies like this, right? The, let's fast forward mm, a few decades. You know, there's a new Adventist study out of California warning people about something else they may be putting in their mouth. And of course, it's not just one study. Um, here's a recent review found that, uh, you know, uh, mortality, all causes put together, heart disease, you know, et cetera, um, lower among those eating more plant-based diets. So instead of someone going along with America's smoking habits or Britain's smoking habits a few decades ago, imagine you or someone you know going along with Britain's eating habits today. What do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize oh, the best available balance of evidence suggests your eating habits not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? If you wait until your GP tells you between bites, to change, uh, it can be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the medical community was still dragging their feet. The AMA actually went on record refusing to endorse the Surgeon General's report. Why? Could it have been because they just got a $10 million check from the tobacco industry? Maybe. OK, so we know why the AMA was sucking up to the tobacco industry, but why weren't individual doctors speaking out? Well, there were a few ahead of their time, speaking up as there are today against industries killing millions. But why not more? Maybe it's because the majority of physicians themselves smoked. Just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat foods that are contributing to our epidemic of dietary diseases. What was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Extensive scientific studies proven smoking in moderation. Oh, that's fine. Sound familiar? Tobacco industry, the food industry used the same tobacco industry tactics, twisting the science, misinformation. 
The same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risks of secondhand smoke and toxic chemicals. The same hired by the National Confectioners Association to downplay the risks of candy. And the same paid by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat. Animal foods and processed foods may be killing 14 million people a year. So this movement that Viva is part of, that many of you are part of, we're talking about a movement that may save the lives of 14 million people every year. Plant-based diets may be considered kind of the nutritional equivalent of stopping smoking. How many people have to die, though, before our respective governments say, uh, don't wait for open-heart surgery to start eating healthy as well? Until the system changes, we have to take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health. We can't wait until society catches up to the science again because it's a matter of life and death. You know, last year, Dr. Kim Williams became president of the American College of Cardiology. He was asked in an interview why he followed the same diet that he advised all his patients to follow. Plant-based diet, he, he, he said, I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. <laughs> Thank you very much.